Good morning. Uh, thinking about our country, the news, I don't follow a lot of news, but a little bit here and there, and um, globally a little bit, and nationally a little bit, and, and I just was done, I think, just for a moment or two, um, yesterday I talked about communism, socialism, and, and how uh, communism and socialism believe in uh, government control, and uh, the government rules the people, and the Bible and I got my glasses out here, the Bible on this side believes in freedom and that people can um, make their own decisions, their own choices. Um, people, and you might say, where, where would we be without laws? Oh, certainly there's a need for laws. Uh, you get a town uh, in the early oh, 1700s going west and it was every man for himself, whoever is the biggest, toughest, had the biggest gun or whatever, um, they were the law. And so people, little by little, got together and they realized we need to rally together to defend our little community or whatever it might be. And as towns developed, um, there was, uh, they might hire a um, Wes Harden or a Bill Hickok or whatever. And um, pretty soon you started taking um, needs in the community and hiring someone because you had a farm and I had a ranch and and somebody else had a store and we couldn't take time away to do those things. So we pooled our money and hired people to take care of the streets and to take care of the, of the, uh, the drunkards on the street or the bank robbers or whatever it might be. And see, um, biblical law is from the, is from the bottom up and the community hires someone to help keep society ordered the way the people would choose. That's why we have uh, have elections, and uh, that's why most countries their elections don't matter because the, the, they're crooked or the people counting them are crooked. But um, if there's anybody that's for law, it's the it's the Bible believer. And the Bible talks so much about the laws and and the doing of right, and um, as until the authorities cross the Bible to be in subjection to the authorities, Romans thirteen in particular. I was at a, a a police, I don't want to say it's a police station, sort of a thing like that. Um, not a normal police station, but a place where it's all law enforcement. And they had Romans 13 on the wall there. And I thought it was interesting. Um, they're the ministers of God to thee for good. And uh, those two words for good, how rarely do people talk about that? Those government officials are only there for good. And when those government officials start doing things for evil, they're no longer in their spot. And um, so the Bible, you know, laws were formed as society developed and, and you know, the garbage collector, right? Everybody and their uncle with garbage all over. And so we, you know, somebody said, I'll start picking up the garbage. We paid, maybe we pooled our money and paid somebody to pick up the garbage. Well, and somebody else thought, I could do it cheaper. And then you got 10 different trucks going down the road, like people doing lawns and landscaping or washing cars in your own yards, which is all fine. But uh, so somebody makes a rule. Um, look, we can't have 10 garbage trucks. It makes too much noise. It's, it's, we're just going to give a contract to each little community. All the companies can bid on it. And still, it's the community working its way up. Now, pretty quick, um, I'm the mayor, I'm the city council or whatever, and I've got a cousin who has some garbage trucks, and so I, I give him the contract, whether he's the cheapest or not. And that's when corruption comes in. And you understand that. And, and uh, where there's mankind, there's going to be corruption. And um, it's, it's just a reality. And we shouldn't throw fits about it. Um, we should thank God that he is not corrupt. And that's who we trust in. But in thinking about what's um, around us in our world, socialism and communism has a ruling military or a ruling class, whatever they are, and they determine laws that are best for them. A biblical uh, constitutional republic, they create laws that are good for the masses. And the rulers are hired servants of the common people. And you, you see the huge difference there is here. 
try going to your local school. I know a lot of you would go to public, you go to a Christian school, but you asking these parents, do they have any say in what, what textbooks are in the classroom? Do they have it? Can they go to the school and determine who is and who is not hired as a teacher? Do they have any control over who teaches? Do they have any control over curriculum? There's some very corrupt things being pushed by the uh, educators unions right now into our schools. And some of these um, school districts that parents have protested and the, and the school district just said, I don't care. You protest all you want. We're teaching what we want. It's our school and we'll teach. Well, see, if parents would realize that socialist, this is the, the, the employee, the teacher, telling the people who hired them what to do, you would throw that out and say, well, we're not putting any kids in your school. We're done. We're done with your school. See, the school teacher shouldn't tell the parent what's being taught. The parent should approve. Now, the parent, maybe the parent is not um, maybe educated enough to know exactly what they want, but if the parent um, has a problem with something being taught, they should have a say in it. Um, I don't care how smart you are, the child's not yours. And so yeah, if the parents don't want algebra and geometry and trigonometry, well, that's their call. Pull their kids out, put them in business math, uh, put them in um, basic accounting. That's the parents' prerogative. It's the school's job to uh, offer courses that will help the parents train the children in the way the parents want them to go and the parents should be doing it in the way that God said. Train up a child in the way they should go, the way God says they should go. You see, it's it's who's pulling the strings, who's in charge. And uh, our universities, our, people pay forty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars a year to send their kids to a university, and oh, they think it's great because they get a fifty thousand dollar scholarship. Now they only have to pay fifty thousand dollars to have their child taught things that mom and dad don't believe. That's corruption. See, that university should be offering courses to uh, honor and, and please and show respect toward the parents. And if I want my child to go to, if I'm paying for him to go to medical school, I don't expect him to learn to be a plumber. I expect him to learn to be a, a, a doctor. And if I send my child to a, a, a plumbing school, a trade school to learn plumbing, I don't expect him to come out an avowed communist. I want him to come out a plumber. And, uh, but see, that's the, that's the socialism and communism telling everybody, this is, you could like it or lump it, you do it our way, we're going to kill you, ultimately. Uh, we'll, we'll uh, you know, we can't make you take a vaccine, but we'll make it so your kids can't go to school without a vaccine. We'll make it so you can't travel without a vaccine. And that's, that is the government ruling over the citizenry. And there's no way in the world that that is what America was founded on. America was founded on, on the government getting their powers from the governed. And, oh, that's a long time ago when that was taking place. But I just want to remind you, uh, pray for your country, because without the Bible and God, we're not going to fix. See, socialism and communism are a government philosophy that is a byproduct that of no God. So you pull the Bible out, you don't get a free republic. You get socialism and communism. You put enough Bible in socialism and communism, and pretty soon you get free thinkers. Pretty soon you get people with their own ideas, and you get people trying and uh, experimenting, and people starting businesses, and people deciding how many children they want to have, and people building their own families. And pretty soon communism and socialism are gone. Why? Because light drives away darkness. But America has long forgotten Sunday school in the Bible. The average home in America never reads a Bible. The average home in America, nobody uh, puts their kids in Sunday school. The average home in America, uh, there's nobody taking time in the home or in a church to teach the, the principles of God's word. And that's a change. Um, I've said this before, but you read any of the writings of our founders. And our founders' writings were filled with scripture. The people who, f the founders and framers of our country, they, their minds and hearts were so filled with scripture. And no, they were not all Christians, but they all knew this was the book. 
They knew there was a creator, a God, a divine power, and they knew he gave us a book, and they knew this was the book of truth and freedom. And now we've got a generation of people who have no clue. They're, they're quoting communists and Marxists, and, and they don't know anything. And so the answer, uh, to, and I feel bad for conservatives I hear on the radio, and once in a while I'll spot somebody on TV. I don't watch much TV, but, but when I do see them, I feel bad for them because they see the evils of socialism and communism. They see how un-American it is, but they forget the light. And uh, we're not going to fix this at the ballot box. I think we should vote. I think we should write letters and all that kind of thing. I have no problem with any of that. But this book is the answer. Now, look over in your Bible to the book of Leviticus. And I want to show you uh, a, a couple of verses in Ezekiel and a couple of verses in Leviticus and tell you where the, the line was drawn. We crossed a line and we began to lose the freedom that light offers. And all the way back in the book of Leviticus, now this came um, from God, uh, Moses on Mount Sinai, and the book of Leviticus is the law, how God wants them to live. Then is Numbers, they're wandering in the wilderness, and then there's Deuteronomy, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And uh, and by the way, I'm teaching the book of Deuteronomy in my adult Sunday school class, so you want to come to my class, nine o'clock, and uh, it's just a new class, and I'm uh, anybody's welcome, of course, but I'm looking for, I'm not looking to pull people from another class. I'm hoping to get new people in my class, and um, I'd rather have 10 new people than 20 people who just moved from another class, and so I'm praying and uh, and, and working and calling and uh, going out soul winning, um, but um, 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the conference room, and, um, and Wednesday nights, we're studying the book of Acts. And uh, we'll be in Acts chapter 3 uh, and uh, going through there. And the, the next few chapters go a little faster than the first couple chapters. But I want to show you something about this thing of light and darkness. Now follow me. Um, look at, uh, at uh, Leviticus chapter 13. And I'm, I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. And he's going through a long list of what we would call the do's and don'ts. And in Leviticus 11, verse 15, I'm sorry, verse 40, if my, my marker is marking it wrong, uh, verse 45, I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So this, he said, I'm your God. I brought you out of Egypt, and I expect you to live holy. Now, the word holy is separate or uh, removed from this unto, it's, it's two part, the word sanctify and the word holy are very close to the same, um, to be removed from Egypt unto Canaan, to be removed from um, drunken and uh, drug use to sobriety, uh, that's holiness, that's one little area of holiness, and he says, because I'm your God, look back at verse 44, for I am the Lord your God, Ye shall therefore sanctify, to sanctify, to set yourself apart. Sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you out of the land of Egypt. Uh, to be your God, ye shall, there, ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Now, um, Leviticus is going to have all kinds of dietary laws and all kinds of laws that have to do with the Jew in the Old Testament. They're going to be 40 years in the wilderness. There's a whole lot of reasons for these, but these are not yours and mine. Over in the book of Romans, it says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, and Colossians says that, that on the cross, um, Christ put away all the laws and the ordinances, which are a shadow of things to come. Uh, they're not for us, not for the bride of Christ, all right? But there's things you learn from it, though, okay? Now look at verse 47. Why these laws and why these things to do and to don't do? Look at verse 47. To make a difference between the unclean and the clean, between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. Now he says these laws that I'm giving you are to draw the line between the clean and the unclean. Now in the Old Testament, pork was unclean, catfish was unclean. Shrimp was unclean. That's a tragedy. I love shrimp. I don't care about catfish. 
but uh, but shrimp, it'd be bad to not have shrimp and not to, to not have bacon and to not have a ham now and then. Um, so um, pickled pig's feet, I don't care if we have pickled pig's feet. But anyway, um, a pork was one of the unclean animals and um, sheep was a clean animal. And I like mutton. We've got some in the freezer, someone we could, it's pretty expensive. We don't buy it, but we have a good friend who, who on occasion can get us some from a, from a meat market and uh, we like lamb, but um, the lamb was clean, um, but a pig was not. And so he said, I want to draw, make a difference. I want, I want to make sure that there's a difference. And he begins early on. If you go to the book of Genesis, God separated the night from the day and God separated the light from the darkness. And all through, you start following the word separate or separation or separated. And you'll see God from the very beginning begins to draw lines of separation. Um, those lines are all illustrative of our New Testament Christian life, that we are to be separate. James 4, 4 says, come out from among them and be separate. Second Corinthians, sec, uh, come out from among them and be separate. James 4, 4 says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. We should be separate from the world. But I want you to notice this, um, the difference. The big issue is to make a difference. To make a difference. You know, in the garden, he made Adam and Eve. There's a difference. Adam and Eve. Those two people. That's what he made. Adam and Eve. And there's a difference between the two. One was a man and one was a woman. And all through the Bible, you see differences. And you'll see that the command of God is that we make that difference very, very plain. The devil, um, the wrong kind of thinking blurs those lines so there is no difference, okay? Um, look over to chapter 20, Leviticus 20, and uh, there's more in between, but I'm just going to give you a couple of quick examples. Leviticus chapter 20, and um, down at verse 24, Leviticus 20, 24, but I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it a land that floweth with milk and honey, I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. He said to the Jew, I have separated you from other people. You are mine. And the Christian today has been separated from others unto God. We have a special relationship. And if you're saved, you have a unique relationship with Jesus Christ. No one else on the planet has. Just the, the person who's saved. Not religious people, but those who put their faith in Christ. And um, uh, very, very special. Verse 25. Ye shall therefore, all right, because God separated us from this world, ye shall therefore put a difference between clean beasts and unclean, and between the unclean fowl and clean, and ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or any manner of living thing that creepeth in the ground, uh, which I've separated from you is unclean. And so again, there's the separation and a difference. He said, I want you to make a difference. I want it to be obvious. Um, I don't want to look like the world, act like the world, sing like the world, use the same vocabulary like the world, have the same morals of the world. If my wife and I are in a restaurant and some unsaved couples in a, uh, the table next to us, if there is no difference between us. It's not because we're better than anyone else. It's not because we're some goody, goody people. No, we belong to the king and there should be a difference and it should be obvious there's a difference and we don't think we're any better. We know we're just sinners saved by grace. But since my father sent his son to die for me, to save me and give me eternal life, I will choose to live as he wants me to live his best. And I'm going to fail, but I'm going to give it a good shot. And I don't look down on the peak couple in the next booth. I'm just telling you, they march to a different beat. They've got different goals, different dreams. And it should be different. And he's saying this over and over. He says it all through the Bible, but he says it over and over because he's reminding them, look, I saved you. I, 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 be I belong to you. You belong to me. So please, it's like God's pleading. I expect you to, to make a difference, a difference in how you deal with things. Look over to the book of Ezekiel with me, Ezekiel chapter 27. Ezekiel is in the major prophets. Ezekiel chapter 27. And he talks about that. Um, of course, Ezekiel, the, um, the, the mess in Ezekiel's day is 
I've got the wrong verse here, I think. Um, go to chapter 44. Chapter 44. And um, chapter 44. Let's see if we can find the right verse here. And um, he's talking about the, the right kind of preachers or priests or the, the people teaching the word of God. And Ezekiel talks much about this. But in verse 23, he says, And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And again, there's the, he says, if, if you're going to be the right kind of teacher of the word of God, you've got to explain the difference between the clean and unclean. One of the problems, I think, in America's um, Christianity is we've got a generation of, for many years, um, let's go back 50 years, people who said, this is wrong, don't do it, but they never said why. And they, when they should have been opening the Bible up and, and saying, this is the difference between the right and the wrong, and this is why this is wrong, this is why this is right. And I, again, I was not reading the Bible, listening to preaching in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, but my impression is that that the few who still believed in holiness and in a separated or sanctified life, um, they, they stopped teaching the why. And to me, it's so important that our, our members of our church know why they believe what they believe. Why is this wrong? Why is this right? And what makes this important? And what makes this important that we do or don't do it this way? And, um, and again, some things are preference. Uh, I, my, uh, my daughter, um, a granddaughter, she'll eat, we have this really good granola type cereal we'll eat and she's happy you just dump a bunch of old yogurt into it and, uh, instead of milk and, and I'm sure it's healthier, but I don't like yogurt. We're not talking about right and wrong on what you do with your cereal. Um, I just want good old fattening heart attack causing milk. But uh, she wants that good, healthy yogurt, which is fine with me. She can have all the yogurt she wants. I will not take it from her. And so I'm not going to eat it. But the, the preacher in, um, in, our, in our world uh, today, preachers are more concerned about a congregation than they are showing the difference between the right and the wrong. And we have evolved a culture of, of religious people who are fearful of explaining the difference between right and wrong. Um, we have a culture where I'm worried about losing my job. I'm worried about uh, being, uh, you know, attacked on social media. And, um, and the whole world of, of um, you can't have an opinion. You can't believe in something strongly. Well, you know what? I do believe very strongly in some things. And people get mad at it. And people get mad at me, and, and when they don't know any other way to, to get mad at me, they'll, you know, you can lie and slander, you can say all kinds of things. And, <clears throat> um, it, but you know what? Um, it, is, it is the preacher's job, it's the church's job to teach right and wrong. That's our job. It's, it's, uh, and as a parent, I think it's our job. But for sure, <clears throat> it's our job to show the difference between that which is right and that which is wrong. And um, going back to the communism-socialism illustration at the beginning, or the Bible and freedom, we allowed, little by little, socialism and communism to creep into our universities. And, in, and then the universities, their people write textbooks, and their people train teachers for our schools. So now we've got people who don't understand uh, morals in our running our schools. They don't understand morally right and wrong. They don't understand what's wrong with with uh, mixed gender locker rooms in a high school. Now, I mean, you can't be so old that you don't know what's wrong with mixed genders in a locker room. Um, to the to the point where we have forgotten the the wrong and the and again, it's this this uh, pushing in of a secularization. Oh, that Bible is old-fashioned, and we have allowed the Bible to be pushed out and a secular perspective to be pushed in. And here's the big switch. The, the communists and socialists didn't come along and say, 
we want you to be communists. What they did is they began saying, we think your opinion matters. And oh, people are fat headed. Yeah, my opinion matters. And so we don't think you should be told what to do by an old archaic book. You have a brain. You should figure it out. Well, see, so as the word of God is pushed out and mankind's opinions and my perspective versus your perspective. Remember, remember years ago, I remember a long time ago when I was a kid, there'd be even commercials on TV. Go to the church of your choice. Well, you know what? It isn't your choice. You should go to the church that God shows you to go to. And obviously we have different opinions, but it's that early. It's, I don't know, Frank Sinatra or whoever it was that sang, I did it my way. It's the glorification of my opinion and my feelings. And so nobody came along and said, hey, we want your kids to be confused what gender they are. Nobody came along and said, we're going to have a government that controls you and tells you what to do and tells you what you can't do. Um, they, they, didn't do they came along and they said, oh, you're important. And so as the light of the word of God is pushed out, now humanity becomes a center. And now, and we called it humanism. And humanism is man-centered. Deism or the theocracy is God-centered, um, Bible-centered. And so we've got this culture that came along where people's opinions were the thing that was most important, where I could make my own decision. And Dr. Spock comes along and says, we well, you know maybe Junior doesn't understand why he can't do this and can't do that. And he may need to kick his mother in the shins and you need to reason with him. Um, now, you don't reason with rattlesnakes. You chop their heads off. And, um, and uh, you, you have to make decisions of right and wrong. And we make them according to the Bible, of course. But um, so once the Bible is pushed out, light is gone. Now we've got a whole bunch of people doing what they think is right. And what I think is right is now, now they start bringing in socialism ideas. Now they start mixing genders. Now they start mixing up marriage or not marriage. Why can't we have two husbands and three wives? And why can't we, um, why do we have to follow certain moral codes? And why do we have to, and, and what happens is little by little, the government is creeping in this socialistic thing. Why? Because where there's no Bible, the light disappears, darkness comes. Where darkness comes, it creates a vacuum that sucks in socialism and communism. And so when mankind forsakes God in the Bible, the light is gone, the light is gone, and then mankind's thinking becomes preeminent. It's a thing that's my view and my perspective. And, well, you know what? Everybody's opinion is different, like belly buttons. We've all got one. Doesn't mean yours is right and mine's wrong. Well, pretty soon, when we are living our life on feelings and living our life on opinions instead of living our life on what's right and wrong, well, who determines right and wrong? This is a good place to start. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights is a good place to start. And... Uh, but when you, that's why the left wants to get rid of Constitution and the Bill of Rights, get rid of those, those evil documents. Why? Uh, because darkness lets opinions rule. And once it's a bunch of opinions, now we're going back to where the government's going to come in and the guy with the biggest gun or the biggest bully is going to run everything. And all oh, this book, yeah, these are the words of life. And again, we ought to pull our kids out of any school that doesn't let God be center. We ought to pull our kids out of any school that doesn't let mom and dad know what's going on. It's been a big problem during this COVID time because the cameras were in the room and the parents started seeing what these teachers were teaching their kids. And it was more like an anti-conservative rally than it was a math or science class. And uh, so again, the move in America for communism and socialism, um, colleges, high schools, elementary schools, the only cure, I believe, is that we get this book back in our homes. We start reading it. We take our kids to Sunday school. We take our kids to church. We as parents begin to model our lives after the word of God. We begin telling our children, this is not right because God says it. This is what we do because God says it. And you see, that's making a difference between the light and the darkness, between right and wrong. And, and it can't be opinion. Because your kid's going to have a different opinion than you. And uh, so all social, moral, economic, uh, all the political differences, if we start here, that makes the big difference. 
and uh, I just I just wanted to to uh, say thank you for the great weekend. And uh, again, uh, I mentioned this um, in a video. I guess it was Sunday night. I did it, but a very awkward Sunday morning. And uh, perhaps you were there. Maybe you're watching online. But if you didn't catch my Sunday night, um, anyway, it wasn't. It was just a hey, everything's okay. But um, I had a very awkward Sunday morning, and and um, but everything's okay. I'm, I'm you know checking with some doctors to figure out how to fix some things up, but. But uh, I am busy, and uh, and God's good. This week, of course, our young people are at camp, and I may go up at, to camp later this week. We'll see. But uh, the first couple of days, I just told the guys we got a great staff. I said, "You guys run it," and I'll let you know if I can get up there. But I, I want all of us to uh, let's pray, let's seek God, pray for your church, pray for God's blessing on your church. And if you go to don't go to our church, pray for your church, um, pray for God's blessing. We want people saved. We want them growing in grace. Um, we want people to to have a passion for God and for his word. And so I hope you'll take time. Take time with God. You, the, the, There's no point in us complaining about the political mess um, if we don't spend time in God's word and get the light of the gospel, the light of this book showing us the difference between right and wrong. And see, when preachers are embarrassed, to say this is right and this is wrong. And if your church, have, you happen to have a pastor, you'll say, hey, this the Bible says is wrong. You ought to say amen. You ought to back him. Um, we ought to, and if your spouse puts it, takes a stand for something that's right or wrong, you ought to back your spouse and, and encourage them. And so uh, let's as the people of God understand that God from the very beginning, he, he said, draw some lines between clean and unclean, right and wrong, light and darkness, and show it, make a difference. And, uh, oh, there's a difference. The problem is our churches today are afraid. You know, it's a. I think, why not stay being a Nazarene? I was never a Nazarene, but if you're a Nazarene, stay a Nazarene. If you're, remember, there was a day the uh, Catholics, they wore the, the unusual hats and the different clothes, and the Nazarenes dressed a, a certain way. And oh, hey, why not? Why, why do we, everybody's got to be a community church now. A uh, twig, a branch, uh, you know, the, the, the wineskin church or whatever. I don't know. Uh, we, they're trying to erase all the differences, and um, not nothing wrong with the differences. And um, and my wife in my closet is separate. Our closet's different. Our halves of our closet is different, and uh, our cars are different. And um, but uh, let's don't be embarrassed about things being different. And uh, but pray for your country, pray for your church, and uh, but let's get near to God and and appreciate anybody who's willing to stand up and say. To make the difference between right and wrong.